Good evening. Tonight, we remember Ronald Wilson Reagan. The 40th President of the United States died today in Los Angeles. He was 93 years old. The official cause of death, pneumonia. But the former president had been battling Alzheimer's disease for 10 years. With him, when the end came at his Bel Air, California home, was his life partner and chief caregiver in his final years, former First Lady Nancy Reagan, and their children, Ron and Patty. Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. CBS News correspondent Leslie Stahl covered the Reagan White House. Ronald Reagan strode into the American presidency on that sunny January day in 1981 like the moral good guy sheriff we'd seen him play in the movies. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will... He looked presidential. He acted presidentially. He had dignity. Edmund Morris, Ronald Reagan's biographer, was given unprecedented access in the White House. He took me back to the president's boyhood home in Illinois, where he says he first began to figure him out. I always feel that when he was president, that his largest mission in life was the moral leadership of the United States. He says Ronald Reagan saw himself as a savior with a mission to tame the government, get it off the backs of the American people. And he wanted to make sure that the United States loomed large on the world stage. Gone was the Carter administration and the malaise it had come to stand for. Brandishing his landslide, Ronald Reagan ran all that out of town. And he did it quickly. In fact, by lunchtime on his inauguration day. So we can all drink to this one. To the new president was able to announce what America had waited 444 days to hear. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free of Iran. 52 Americans held hostage by Iranian militants would be coming home. Though there's no evidence he had anything to do with securing their release, Ronald Reagan was the beneficiary. He got right down to business. And I have only one thing to say to the tax increasers. Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> Proposing massive tax cuts and deep spending reductions, which the Democrats criticized as trickle-down economics and welfare for the rich. But the wrangling and political backbiting stopped cold when... A gunman opened fire, an assassination attempt. It was just three months into the presidency. I didn't know I was shot. In fact, I was still asking, what was that noise? I thought it was firecrackers. The bullets from John Hinckley's gun missed the president's heart by an inch. He almost died. And you write about how this changed him. He became, for the first time in his life, spiritual. He felt that he had been spared, and um, everything he did after that, he did with the sense that it was for the permanent good of the United States. The shooting made Ronald Reagan a hero and helped him restore power to the presidency. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. His proposal to cut government and taxes passed in the first hundred days of his presidency. If you will look back over his life, you will notice that somehow he got everything he wanted. He always prevailed. He was charming and appealing a movie star turned president who lived up to his reputation as the great communicator as when he commemorated the 40th anniversary of D-Day on the beach at Normandy. We stand on a lonely windswept point on the northern shore of France. And lift on. When the space shuttle Challenger's astronauts, including a school teacher, died before the world's eyes, he led the country in communal mourning. We will never forget them nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. When it came to his enemies, he rode them hard, like the Soviet Union, which he called the evil empire. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call... I was there when he did his evil empire speech. 
and, and it was breathtaking and he was really greatly criticized for this. Well, a lot of Russians will tell you that, that when he used that language, that biblical language, the evil empire, um, that was when they for the first time began to accept the fact that they were indeed an evil system. The president asked Congress for an additional $180 billion in defense spending. He put mid-range nuclear missiles in Europe and aimed them at Moscow. When it came to the Russians, it was always high noon. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. As he understood the power of images, only one person could stand in front of it and say that and not give the impression of hokiness. In your book, do you give him credit for basically ending the Soviet Union? I certainly think that if it was not for his moral confrontation with the Soviet Union, with Gorbachev in particular, I don't think it would have happened as soon. His first summit meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, Geneva, 1985. We were all scared. We all had the feeling that Gorbachev was going to eat him alive. Was he scared? That's what I was asking. I thought to myself, he must be terrified. And I asked him about it afterwards. He said, no, no, I was not scared. And you know, he was not. The two had an instant rapport. The sheer force of their personalities would help bring about a turning point in US-Soviet relations. But in the meantime, the president fought communist insurgencies, especially in Central America flexing American military muscle on the Caribbean island of Grenada. I took the president for a golfing weekend, and the first night we woke him up at 2 o'clock in the morning because we had all these urgent messages from Grenada. And basically he decided to go ahead with the rescue operation in Grenada. The next night, we woke him up again about 2 o'clock in the morning, and this was with the news of the car bombing of our barracks in Beirut. I have just met with the families of many of those who were killed. I think all Americans would cradle them in our arms if we could. Terrorism targeted at Americans increased during his presidency, and it proved to be one of Mr. Reagan's toughest challenges at a time when he was dealing with questions about his age, his competency, and his stamina. June 14, 1985, TWA Flight 847 is hijacked after leaving Athens. He has pulled a hand grenade pin, and he is ready to blow up the aircraft if he has to. We then Americans were taken hostage in Beirut. Doing everything we can. Doing everything we can. In an attempt to free the hostages, the president agreed to a secret scheme to sell arms to Iran in exchange for the release of the Americans. But even his secretary of state was against the idea. Arms for hostages is a misguided idea because it only encourages hostage taking and leads to disastrous results. It was a political disaster. His reputation and prestige took a beating. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. Ironically, his old nemesis, the Soviet Union, helped divert attention from the debacle. Gorbachev came to Washington in late 1987 to sign a nuclear weapons treaty. For the first time, it reduced the huge arsenals that threatened Armageddon. He was attacked by Nixon, by Kissinger, by Scowcroft, by lots of people for doing that. And I think in the sweep of history, you just have to say that his judgment was better by far than his critics' judgment was. By the time he said goodbye to the nation... This is the 34th time I'll speak to you from the Oval Office and the last. We've been together his credit eight, list was long, but the one that stands out, ending the Cold War, will most certainly be how he is remembered most in history. Does he care that much about how historians will see him, how you're going to write about him? I don't think he had that sort of vanity. Reagan was content with what he achieved. He didn't even really want credit for it. 
in the sense that um, he was content with the fact that the world had changed as a result of his stewardship. What you see is what you get. Ronald Reagan left the White House in 1989. He spent his final years confined to his California home. CBS's Jerry Bowen in Los Angeles has the latest on how the nation will say goodbye to Ronald Reagan. Jerry? Dan, President Reagan's body will lie in repose at his Simi Valley California library, perhaps starting tomorrow, setting off a week of official ceremonies and tributes, including the funeral in Washington, and then his final journey home. At the Reagan Library, located on a hilltop in Simi Valley, California, where the 40th president will be laid to rest, visitors brought flowers to his statue, along with their memories. Very significant figure, obviously, in, in the history of the state and then also in our nation, and uh, certainly somebody that I have a lot of respect for. It's, it's sad, but also probably a relief for his family. Friends also brought flowers to the Reagan's gated estate, where the president died just after midday, and where his family had gathered at his bedside over the past two days place where his privacy was guarded by his wife, Nancy, who opened a small window on his health last month when she spoke at a diabetes fundraising event. Ronnie's long journey has finally taken him to a distant place where I can no longer reach him. We can't share the wonderful memories of our 52 years together, and I think that's probably the hardest part. And in a statement released tonight, Nancy Reagan said, we appreciate everyone's prayers. Dan? Jerry, born in Los Angeles, thanks.